Good afternoon. Welcome to the Critical Issues Confronting China Seminar Series. Uh, I am Wendy Yip, Inter Interim Director of the Fair Bank Center for this year. In December 2020, when ASRA concluded the last seminar in the fall series, I think all of us have expected to see him today opening the spring series, and he has done so for so many past years. We immensely said that Astra is not here today with us in person, but I, and I think many of you know that his spirit is with us. Many of us, including myself, have been inspired by Astra's scholarship and impact in the world, touched by his generosity and friendship, and also moved by his humanity. I'm also grateful to Bill Overhold and Bill Xiao, Astra's long-term colleagues, friends and collaborator for this seminar to step in so quickly to plan the spring series. We're thrilled to have Professor Mike Lumpton as the first speaker. And I think Mike will, I thank Mike for allowing us to take a few minutes to remember Ezra. It is not possible to pay tribute to Ezra's accomplishments in just a few minutes. A full memorial is being planned for a later date and it will be announced. And let me invite Bill Overhaul to give a few uh, brief remarks. Bill, please. Thank you, Winnie. Uh, we miss Ezra Vogel, the founder of this lecture series, for many reasons. He was an exceptional scholar, drawing from many disciplines, sociology, political science, economics, anthropology, history. He spoke Japanese and Chinese and communicated deeply with people in those languages. Ezra was an institution builder. This lecture series is just the smallest creation of a man who built scholarly centers, teaching programs, and exchange programs across Harvard. Ezra was a convener and conciliator of international stature and consequence. He brought Chinese and Japanese scholars together to discuss the contentious history of World War II and seek common ground. His last effort was to bring senior Chinese and American scholars uh, together in the hope of building shared understandings. When Ezra called, important people answered. When Ezra convened, the dialogue was civil, warm, and enlightening. On top of all his professional achievements, Ezra was always the most devoted of teachers and mentors. I had my last class with Ezra in 1966. 26 years later in 1992, he took an essay of mine to a publisher without even mentioning that he was doing it. Uh, that unplanned book changed the rest of my life. Years after that, he, uh, intervened in a pretty consequential crisis my daughter was having over an economics class. Uh, nobody else would know Ezra solved the problem. Hundreds of people had that experience of Ezra and hundreds went on to influential careers with a boost from Ezra. Ezra was a great man we're determined to perpetuate his legacy. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bill. And let me invite Dan Murphy, Executive Director of the Fairbank Center to say a few words. Thank you, Winnie, and welcome everyone. Um, Ezra's many, many accomplishments across his long career are well-documented in public sources. Perhaps somewhat less well-known is what Ezra meant to the faculty, staff, and students whom he encountered every day around the Fairbanks Center, at Harvard, 
and at nearby universities. To the many people he encountered, including me, he was not just a generational scholarly talent, but also a friend, a wise guide, and an inspiration. I know that I and everyone at the Fairbank Center will miss him greatly. I wanna join Winnie in thanking Bill Xiao and Bill Overholt for continuing with the Critical Issues Confronting China event series this summer. I also want to thank Mike Lampton for agreeing to speak today at the first Critical Issues Confronting China event series event without Ezra. Mike knew Ezra well, and I believe his work is resonant with Ezra's. So thank you, Mike. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Dan. Let me turn to invite uh, Bill Xiao to say a few words, and also I'd like to turn over the moderation of today's panel to you as well. Thank you. Uh, let me just give a personal testimony about Ezra. I first met Ezra when I came to Harvard as a graduate student in 1970. He immediately impressed me as a different kind of scholar. At a personal level, he wants to know you and understand you first. When he study a nation like Japan or China, he did not study them as objects. He first wanted to understand their people and the reality on the ground. Because I do research in China and stay in Chinese villages, Ezra wanted to know in detail from me about the lives in rural China and their social relations. Undoubtedly, Ezra's writing reflected his humanity in understand China and Japan. Now, I'm going to ask Nick to give us some instructions before I introduce our esteemed speaker today. Thank you, Bill. Um, and thank you all of uh, everyone for joining us today. Um, this, this is the same format that we normally use for critical issues. Um, it is being recorded. Um, so be conscious of that when, when asking questions, there is an anonymous question option. Um, and you do that by using the Q&A panel at the bottom of your screen. Um, we will try to get to as many questions as we can today. Um, we may not get to everybody's, but we thank you all for questions and attention. Thanks, Nick. We are honored to have Professor Mike Lampton to open our forum in this new semester. Mike needs no introduction to specialists in China studies. I first got introduced to Mike through his scholarly writing. I read his early book, The Politics of Medicine in China. My mind was open to a new visitor. Mike is a preeminent authority on China and US-China relations. Besides served as a chair professor at Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies and directed their China study, Mike was president of Asia Foundation and the National Committee on U.S.-China Relations. He was named the most influential expert on China in 2015. If I give you all of his lifetime achievements and prizes he won, you will take up our whole session today. So without further ado, let me turn over to Mike, who will present a most timely, important subject on our minds. Mike. Well, uh, good afternoon, and thank you very much, Bill. I, I want to thank the 
Fairbank Center and director Winnie Yip, and as I just did, Bill Shaw and Dan Murphy uh, for inviting me, uh, particularly on this very special day. Uh, I want to thank you also for the fact that um, uh, I recognize that Bill Shaw and Bill Overhold and Ezra led this esteemed seminar. And when I happened to be in uh, Cambridge, I uh, came and I remember addressing this group earlier in 2015. So I'm just very glad to uh, have the opportunity to speak, particularly at this time. Uh, I guess what I would say is that I uh, share this Harvard community sense of loss uh, about it with respect to Ezra. Uh, it's very acute uh, for all of us and not least me. Um, and I had a, my introduction to Ezra was just emblematic of everything that everybody has said uh, preceding me today. And that was, I was a young graduate student at uh, Stanford, uh, just beginning to think about my dissertation and my advisor, John Lewis knew Ezra as everybody in the field did. And he, uh, John Lewis, uh, re recalled that Ezra had done interviews in Hong Kong on medicine, on working on my dissertation and then book that Bill Shaw mentioned. And John picked up the phone, called Ezra and said, did you do some interviews on healthcare in China and Hong Kong? And Ezra said, yes. And uh, Ezra offered to open up his entire files to me of all of those interviews. And I guess it wasn't only the, the information I gleaned from all of this, which was tremendous, uh, but it was the sense of self-confidence that somebody like Ezra Vogel was interested in a young scholar's work. It must be important if Ezra Vogel's interested. Uh, so that, that had a profound impact, just, uh, just the recognition of interest in young scholars. And uh, I think that was one of his, not his, by any means his only legacy, but a very a big uh, a legacy. I think Ezra and I shared a, a commitment to, uh, or I shared Ezra's commitment to uh, field research and at the same time taking knowledge and conveying it in ways that uh, uh, hopefully uh, improve the public dialogue. We certainly throughout our careers, I think, shared that. Uh, also, one other just sort of in idiosyncratic way, Ezra and I, uh, I think, connected, or at least I certainly connected to him. I started my career in Ohio, at Ohio State, only a few miles from where Ezra grew up in Delaware, Ohio. And we often talked about Ohio, and I think, uh, at least speaking for myself, I think it both that experience shaped us uh, and uh, it's certainly with Ezra, a sort of down to earth, interested in people, sort of what you associate the, the finer values of the middle part of our country, I think he very much embodied. So any case, I'm honored to be here. Uh, I think we're gonna have a discussion here that would have very much interested uh, Ezra and to which he would have contributed uh, greatly. Um, Turning to U.S.-China relations, particularly at, at this moment, I think we really face a, uh, a situation that could be characterized uh, as having a, a primary necessity at this moment. And that is we really have to, as a nation, people, scholars, uh, people recommending policy or just being good citizens, I think we have to establish where China fits in our overall national priority list, which I would include both domestic and foreign, and also uh, more narrowly in the national security area. So I think the background for this discussion is really, and I hope we can interact, where really does China fit in our national interests? and as a priority. Uh, and maybe put it, I'll put it a little uh, succinctly and uh, a little uh, uh, exaggerated uh, phraseology to spark discussion. 
But is China our number one priority? Should it be? Uh, and I mean, national security priority. Uh, certainly, where does foreign policy fit given our own domestic challenges? So I think this whole discussion raises the issue of where should China fit on our national priority list or even narrowly our national security list. And there are many contenders for that. And I'll just tick them off. It'll be obvious, but we're in a kind of unique period of multiple challenges. Certainly there's the pandemic and China's relationship to that pandemic's an interesting <laughs> sidebar. But certainly until we get our economy going and our society reordered after this challenge, uh, that's going to shape how important and what we do with respect to China to some extent. Certainly there's global climate change. There's rebuilding as a challenge the allied support uh, for US foreign policy with respect to China and much else. There's the security challenge of domestic, which we're not used to thinking about, about national security, meaning safeguarding 50 state capitals and the national capital. That's not a topic of national security we've usually had to uh, talk about. Uh, also, where does Russia fit? Now you think back to Nixon and Kissinger and Carter and Brzezinski and Mao, Zhou, Deng Xiaoping, Russia was a central consideration. It's now becoming a, a central consideration again, but in a different way. So I, I can see that, you know, we've got multiple challenges, domestic and foreign, uh, and that as a nation, I think we don't have the luxury of only picking one thing to deal with. So I'm not proposing that. But we do have limited resources and we have multiple competitors for that attention. And I think we need to think, uh, sort of not follow the herd on, on uh, the current priority list, uh, at least from my point of view. Now, the US has a new administration and I should say just at the outset, though nobody should be uh, uh, confused, I don't speak for the new administration. Uh, uh, I welcome the new administration, but I don't want anyone to think uh, that I'm purporting to speak for them. I'm trying to observe what I think they're doing. Uh, they may agree or disagree with that uh, analysis. Uh, but if I were to try to just say what I think it, it, it is that um, is going to happen in the next period of time is, first of all, I think it's already rather clear that the Biden administration will not change immediately and maybe even in the more distant future, a lot of the policies or certainly policy direction of the Trump administration. And I also should make clear my view that all of the problems we have with China coming into this new administration were not created by the Trump administration. We had problems, uh, building problems uh, back to the Obama and Hu Jintao eras. So I want to sort of establish those two uh, baselines. Uh, if you just think back to the uh, Obama and uh, Hu Jintao periods, I mean, we had the, uh, the, the rebalance, the so-called pivot to Asia, moving relative uh, allocation of naval and other resources to the Pacific. We had uh, Secretary Clinton in 2010 talk about the South China Sea, and uh, I would say inject, and I don't mean that to be a negative valence term, but inject the U.S. into the South China Sea issue in a way it had not been uh, before. Uh, and of course, there were human rights concerns all along the way in Hong Kong, Xinjiang, Tibet, and so forth. So as critical as I, I would be of the Trump administration, we can't, I think, uh, uh, load all of the current problems of the relationship on its shoulders. And of course, China itself plays a major uh, role. But if you just look at the uh, Biden administration as it came in, uh, and the last flurry of activities of the Trump administration, whether it was with respect to uh, Xinjiang and the vocabulary we use to describe what's going on there, 
or the Taiwan, the way in which we were going to interact with Taiwan. Uh, the Trump administration made some of uh, what you might call bold, others might use different vocabulary, but notable uh, last minute uh, changes. And uh, the, the current administration has not rejected them and indeed associated itself with the, if not the implementation style, certainly the, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the directional, directionality of that. Um, so I think another thing that we can see clearly though is that there will be some differences. And those differences will include uh, certainly, a, well, I think it's fair to say there was no policy process that was stable, predictable, and in, included a, a rational interagency process under the Trump administration. And what you have coming back is people who know the process, have participated in, in great measure in previous administrations, the Clinton and or uh, Obama administrations. And they are process people, fact-based, database people that are gonna have an interagency process. Uh, and you won't be uh, wondering how the uh, chief executive is contradicting uh, his bureaucrats uh, along the way for the most part. Uh, also, I think unlike the preceding administration, I was just speaking to a senior uh, a Chinese official, and if I remember his numbers correctly, at least it's what he said, there were about 108 dialogues under the Obama administration, and there were four under the Trump administration. So I won't, won't hold for the figures, but uh, I think the incoming administration uh, will probably have fewer and I hope better dialogues than were characteristic of the Obama period, but that will be more inclined to dialogue. And I think in important areas, not least strategic, well, I hope arms control and so forth. So I'm not trying to say Biden's going all in the same direction as his predecessor, but in important ways and, and, and of concern to China, uh, they are at least at this moment rhetorically identifying them, themselves with some of the uh, Trump initiatives late on. And uh, that is deeply worrisome to the Chinese, and they will be watching uh, carefully about all of that. Now, I think we need a little, uh, I'm trying to provide a little context, and then I really want to make three points. The other part of the context I think we need to keep in mind is, and I think, uh, you know, often American popular commentary, uh, folk always is preoccupied with what is the domestic politics in the United States? Why are we behaving the way we are? Uh, often it's, there's less attention devoted to Chinese politics than why the Chinese themselves are behaving the way uh, they are. And I think one background factor in as we try to understand China's behavior is that in a way they have their elections too. Uh, they're not the same kind of elections as ours, but their 20th party Congress is coming up in 2022. And just like our campaigns run for multiple years with people positioning themselves and trying to uh, enhance their attractiveness for future political power, uh, that is true in spades in China. And the 20th Party's Congress is coming up and Xi Jinping wants to consolidate his power and I think uh, prolong indefinitely uh, his claim to uh, the uh, leadership, uh, whether it's through posts or just uh, power divorced from posts. But uh, I don't think Xi Jinping's planning on going anywhere and he's gonna make sure to the best of his ability he doesn't. And right now, uh, the appeal to nationalism, popular resentment uh, in many cases against the United States, some fostered by the regime itself, but some, the regime itself is responding to popular opinion. But we can't ignore, uh, I think, the contest for power that is going on uh, in China. Uh, also, we have uh, other contexts for this, obviously, the ongoing cl uh, clampdowns in Hong Kong, in Xinjiang. China's also, I'll just put it out there, strong-arming smaller countries. 
you know, Australia, Norway, Z New Zealand, Canada. I mean, uh, that is not reassuring behavior beyond the countries on China's immediate uh, periphery. So we see a sort of nationalistic driven uh, uh, power competition elite in China uh, consolidating itself. And we see a more assertive foreign policy. Um, you know, Mao used to talk about the first and second intermediate zones. And the idea was to win over the intermediate zone. Well, China's on occasion trying to do that, but on some occasion, uh, in other instances, is alienating them. The other context uh, I think that is important in terms of, of China, the context in China is uh, China's leaders and uh, people's a more complicated story, but basically China's leaders think their policy is doing pretty well. And they also think the US isn't doing very well. As one leader that I spoke to not too long ago says, the basic story of public opinion in China is China rising, US falling. Now we can debate that. I don't, in, I think it underestimates our resilience. I think it underestimates China's problems. But in a way, it doesn't matter what we think if that's the dominant paradigm that the Chinese people, in a way, share with their leaders. Uh, and so we see China uh, referring to progress in a number of areas. Just take economic growth. Uh, I guess in the first quarter of uh, 2020, China didn't do very well, but thereafter has done pretty well and it has somewhere I don't want to argue about the figures, but four to six percent GDP growth. Some people are predicting for the next year six or seven percent. But the point is that there is significant economic growth going on in China, and China's leaders think they're on the right track. And they look at comparative growth elsewhere, and they're not impressed. Uh, so that's the first thing to keep in mind. Also, technologically, I mean, just Keep in mind, China's now launched the, uh, its Chang'e 5 lunar probe successfully, brought back matter from the face of the moon and so forth. China's just signed an investment protection agreement with the EU. There'll be some arguments in the EU itself about that agreement. China just signed it with a, a free trade arrangement, RCEP, with 16 countries uh, in Asia. And as uh, one leader I just spoke to not too long ago said is, we don't feel we need to dance to the tune of containment. So I think this gives you a sense that uh, whether we think the judgment is sound or not, we're dealing with a China that thinks it's doing pretty well and thinks we're not doing very well. And maybe the prospects of change for the better in the US are not as great as we would a uh, hope. So I think that's some of the uh, background. Now, with all that that uh, sort of scattershot provision of context, let me try to deal very uh, hopefully in bullet fashion with three points or questions, and then I think we'll have plenty of grist for what I hope is a um, uh, productive and satisfying Q and A period. Point one is I'd like to address the whole issue of how did we get to where we are in this relationship? Because I think it's very important uh, that we understand the range of problems that brought us to the present day uh, with the idea that we're going to have to uh, uh, recognize on the one hand, the, the pluses that we achieved in, in engagement but also some of the problems that arose in its course. Uh, that brings me to the second point, and that is if one was trying to create a balance sheet of pluses and minuses of the 40 years of engagement, uh, what would such a balance sheet, at least in my view, uh, look like? And frankly, I think we're underestimating the pluses of engagement and uh, coming to a kind of collective uh, group think that, uh, you know, engagement was a big mistake. Now, I think the truth of the matter is that engagement as we thought of it for the last 40 years 
has run its course. It's not going to be reestablished in any recognizable form if the standard is the previous 40 years. But on the other hand, I think we, uh, without recognizing that positive balance sheet earlier on, we are prone to underestimate the opportunity and direct costs of increasing conflict with China. So this isn't an academic exercise, what was the balance sheet, let it go. It's important that we realize what opportunities we're foregoing and what cost of the nation and as a, a group of uh, like-minded countries and as a world, what's the price that uh, increasing conflict and friction with China's going to present. And finally, I guess I, I always try to end with at least the attempt uh, to answer the question or address the question, uh, what could we conceive of in the current circumstance as some positive, albeit incremental moves in a positive direction? It took a long time to get where we are and it's gonna take a long time to work out of the hole if we can. And I would underscore if. Yes. So let me just briefly uh, deal with each of those uh, is issues. How did we get to where we are? And of course, we would all agree, and I think it's true, that uh, big things in history happen for many reasons, not one master variable. Uh, now, some considerations are more important, perhaps, than others, but usually it's multifactor. But if I were to just try to organize uh, our, our thinking uh, uh, about a, a, a factor that I think drives to a considerable extent what's happening is its security. I'd put forth a kind of hypothesis that the deteriorating security relationship between the United States and China is not only a problem in and of itself, but it infects our, uh, I'd say infects, I don't mean to have such negative uh, valence that that term suggests, but certainly spills over into the economic realm uh, and spills over into the educational and cultural realm, particularly uh, in as much as the uh, educational and cultural realm relates to technology, competitive capacity, economically and militarily. So it seems to me that the sort of master undergirding variable is declining a, a, a security a circumstance. Uh, now we're all familiar with why Nixon and Kissinger and Carter and Brzezinski and Mao and Zhou and, and Deng Xiaoping uh, all moved towards each other in the uh, late 70s, uh, well, in the late 60s, 70s. And the Russia, uh, the Soviet Union played a major part of the calculus there. Economics wasn't the major driver, although I'm more important for Carter than I think for uh, Nixon. But if you now look at where we are in our security relationship with China, rather than being a supportive consideration, security has now become a, a fundamental conflictual point. And if you just look at the Trump administration issued um, four major strategic documents starting in December 27 and going up through an, a rather odd, but I think important document issued by the White House in 2020, all of them basically identified China as a fundamental threat to our security, our values, and our interests. So it was, and it, it different documents had a little different valence, but it was pretty clear that China was the biggest long-term problem in the view of the strategic documents of the Trump uh, administration. So uh, that was certainly, I think, uh, a major thing the Chinese uh, paid attention to. Uh, unlike what brought us together, that is China and the US coming together to, to balance off or drive a wedge uh, between the Soviet Union and any uh, effectiveness in the international environment. Now our policy is almost explicitly driving Russia and China together. So I think you would want to ask yourself, is that in our interest? Uh, are the, the uh, enduring continuity in American foreign policy has been that we should never uh, create a circumstance in which 
a single country or a coalition of countries can dominate the Eurasian landmass. And uh, Nixon was fully consistent with that. I would say the current policy is perfectly inconsistent with at least that particular uh, objective. So uh, secondly, uh, I think you uh, want to say that this security, and, and let me make it clear, I think there's lots of reasons in the security realm to be worried what China's doing. So don't, I, I'm not saying it's illusory, all these problems, but I think there's a widespread recognition shared in the Democratic Party uh, that these are problems. So the security relationship going south is I think important and it's spilled over into economics. And if you just think about all the ways it's spilled into economics, just take the fact that Chinese foreign direct investment was growing rapidly uh, about a year and a half ago and it, or two years ago, and it's sort of fallen off a cliff in part because the Chinese are being more careful, but also because the United States is developing a series of policies to discourage at least certain types of Chinese investment in the US. You're also seeing more export controls. You're ob obviously seeing tariff policy, which the Biden administration has not yet said it will uh, move off those uh, tariffs imposed by Trump and so forth. But as the economic and security relationships deteriorate, this spills over into the, econo uh, into the educational and cultural area. And you now find uh, uh, congressional hearings on uh, you know, Chinese students and um, visiting fellows and all sorts of intellectual exchange. Uh, who's funding this research? Where is the intellectual property going? Uh, are we hemorrhaging security important uh, technological development? Uh, is China living off our basic research and improving its military capacity and so forth? You're finding all of the kinds of questions you would expect if you think education, innovation, technological advance is going to drive your national power. And China and the United States have the same theory. Innovation will drive comprehensive national power. Now, I think the US is in a much better position to be innovative, frankly, than China. But China is increasing it dramatically its human resources and engineering, uh, and not to mention its longstanding efforts since the late 70s to train a generation of technologically uh, astute and brilliant people uh, all over the world. So this is in fact, the, this security deterioration from my viewpoint has just gone across the economic domain and also the um, uh, cultural and educational. Now it's also true that much of the problem in the economic areas because uh, Americans in general and American companies, particularly in the high tech field, but not limited to that, feel China hasn't provided a level playing field. They lose technology. Uh, there are lots of legitimate complaints Americans have about doing business in China. But if I were just to kind of say, where's the root cause of this, I'd put it in the security domain, which is why when I, I talk in a few minutes about what to do, you're gonna see dialogue and particularly in the strategic and arms control area is very important, at least in my view, because you have to address the security uh, insecurity before you can, I think, really fully repair the other uh, dimensions. Um, now, point, uh, you know, the second point I really wanna make is that as we think about what to do in the future, let's not forget all the good things that happened in the past. That'd be the sort of, um, uh, my sort of a crisp way of putting uh, the question. And I think there was uh, a lot of good that happened and that we are gonna pay some pretty heavy prices if we pursue, and I don't mean we, just the US, I mean, we, China and the US go down this course, there are gonna be a lot of opportunity course, but let me just, uh, pick a few areas that where I see a big positive net for the last 40 years of engagement. 
of course, uh, I won't dwell on it. Everybody always talks about it, but it's important. Uh, per capita income, when China began, uh, in sort of in the reform era, was around the level of Cambodia and Haiti. And of course, now China's somewhere in the ballpark of 10 plus thousand dollars. Uh, China's got a long way to go. Uh, but the, the point is that uh, China has moved from a, a nutritional deficit country when we started engagement to being the biggest purchaser of American farm goods. China's uh, uh, nutritional uh, advance has not only been a commercial boon to much of the United States, uh, but has also accounted for between a third and two third of all the nutritional improvement in the world during that period. So uh, huge, uh, I would say food and everything associated with it has big commercial implications and big human rights cons uh, considerations, uh, human rights in the sense of economic, social development and human basic uh, security. Uh, also, I think you, uh, you, there are things you don't often think about, but one, I think Bill Overhold and uh, many of us uh, older persons started going to China and flying there in the 1970s. Uh, flying in China was not safe per particularly, not to mean mention inconvenient. Uh, but early on, uh, for uh, largely commercial reasons, to be sure, Boeing and the FAA cooperated with China. And as now, China has one of the safest air traffic control and management systems in the world today. Our safety record at least as good as the United States. So uh, everybody who goes to China may not recognize it, but uh, the safety and convenience with which they move around, at least in China's air system, has a lot to do with cooperation with the United States. And I should give credit to Airbus and uh, Europeans uh, aviation industry had the same uh, interests. Uh, a whole nother area, and it's very pointed to me because I live in downtown Washington right near the mall. And every uh, day I go out and take my exercise. And of course, the mall is straddled by all these monuments. And what are these monuments? There's a Vietnam monument, 50,000 50, persons, Americans perished in that. There's the Korean, another, broadly speaking, 50,000 Americans. Go down to World War II, somewhat different uh, uh, circumstance, but nonetheless, China, importantly, uh, and with the US involved in World War II. But my point is that if you ask from 1949 to 1975, when the US left Vietnam, how many people died? The answer is a lot. And it had to do with China. The cold, hot wars of the Cold Wars, the Cold War were in Asia. And since 1975, uh, no Americans have died in conflict with China. We had the dust up uh, between Vietnam and China. And I'm not saying China's periphery has been entirely a quiet. Uh, recent Indian uh, de uh, developments along the Indian border, uh, notwithstanding. But the point is that there was a huge peace dividend uh, to what has occurred. Uh, also, I guess uh, you know you could go to the health area. We're all kind of, I suppose, traumatized by what I think is fairly described as a um, a unfortunate, botched, mistaken, non-transparent uh, initial Chinese approach to COVID-19. We can talk about that if you want, but it wasn't the kind of cooperation in the health area that the U.S. and China had had before that. Uh, and we had cooperated on uh, the Ebola virus in, in Africa. We cooperated on the uh, H7N9, highly lethal virus. China developed a vaccination before the rest of the world and made that available. We had good cooperation, basically, between China, US, and uh, the World Health Organization. From my point of view, there's no reason on earth we can't do that again. 
just in the educational realm, and I don't mean to, uh, you know, um, uh, boil down the value of education to dollars, but if you look at the the financial implications of declining U.S.-China educational exchanges, uh, Chinese students in the U.S., 350,000 plus, represent by the U.S. government under Trump's own calculations is an export industry in effect of $15 billion. That's equivalent to the high export value of soybeans at the height. So, and, and of course, there are all the spinoffs and this research uh, assistance, uh, Chinese language study, all, so it's not all money, but the money in US-China educational exchanges is a big issue for a lot of schools. So the point is, and I don't want to, there are many other ways you could talk about the gains of engagement, but they are big and they will in relative terms probably be diminished the higher the conflict level goes between the United States and China. Now, the final point is we enter the Biden uh, uh, era and China enters its, uh, or it continues with its current policy and consolidation of power by Xi, uh, I think we can expect uh, a long time of dealing with the regime as we see it unfolding in China. Of course, anything can happen, but I wouldn't premise long-term policy on big changes in Beijing uh, anytime soon. Uh, now, I think we can also expect in the Biden administration an attempt to act more multilaterally with China. But it's hard for me to see how cooperative China is going to be in multilateral circumstances if we're pursuing a highly conflictual policy bilaterally. And by that, I don't mean that the U.S. is the only source of uh, difficulty here. But I think the new administration will push for a more multilateral approach. But how receptive the Chinese will really be, we need to see. Now, it's true that the Chinese have uh, just recently uh, even up their uh, Paris climate related commitments. That's a good thing. Uh, China has now let in the WHO uh, uh, team to look into the origins of, of COVID. Uh, and uh, also made noises about cooperating on vaccination and treatments and so forth, all to be welcome. But it seems to me there is an inherent friction between trying to pursue a rather comprehensively uh, constraining policy on Beijing and then uh, hoping for a high degree of cooperation uh, multilaterally. A third thing that I think we have to ask about what's going to happen, a mantra of the Biden administration, with which I agree, is that the U.S. should quit alienating its allies and friends, first of all, and secondly, rebuild alliances. I, I broadly, not broadly, I agree with that. Uh, but you have to ask how receptive are our allies and friends going to be? China's two top trading partners now are Southeast Asia and the EU. The US is number three. And you can already see that uh, Europe uh, just signed this bilateral uh, investment agreement. Uh, President, French President uh, Macron has uh, indicated that uh, France, and I think he proposes to speak for the EU, uh, at least on some occasions, wants to um, have an independent European strategy, foreign policy and security uh, strategy. And we saw Germany uh, resistant to uh, signing on to America's uh, 5G sort of denial strategy with respect to China. So I think the administration wants to move in a direction that has allied support, the idea being uh, we need all the help we can get dealing with a dynamic China. But it's not clear that where our allies will join or separate from us. And the Chinese are and will continue. And if we were them, we'd do the same thing, trying to separate us from our allies. And so this is not going to be easy to uh, overcome. 
Now, um, just to, to wind up uh, in about four minutes here, and I think I'm on, on time here, what might I suggest are some areas to try to move uh, forward? And I think there are a number of things uh, that we, we could do. Uh, certainly, I think the lowest hanging fruit, although my conversations with Chinese even uh, suggest this isn't so easy, is restore our health and education cooperation. We ought to get our CDC personnel back in China that we unwisely uh, pulled out. Uh, we've already gotten back into the W. Uh, HO, so that's uh, a good thing. Uh, we uh, certainly on education, I, uh, it just beyond me how we did away with the Fulbright program in China. Uh, so I think we ought to certainly do those kind of things. We ought to um, uh, have a much more attractive and reassuring policy on Chinese students coming to the United States. And of course, I wish China would do the same with respect uh, to our students and scholars uh, there. But certainly I would see health education as the lowest hanging fruit, most feasible. But what I will tell you is uh, certainly one Chinese talking to me as a scholar in this case, when I raised the issue of restoring Fulbright and exchanges said, well, you know, Professor Lampton, that there is a feeling in some circles in China that this uh, such programs are peaceful evolution. It might not be so easy to restore these programs in the per in the present um, uh, circumstance. So certainly that's an area. Climate change, I think, is another big area of opportunity because the Chinese have, I think, fundamentally changed their policy, which not so long ago amounted to you industrial countries created the problem, you industrial countries solved the problem. Now China, I think, fully realizes, understands, and is moving in a direction uh, that's logical because China's going to be more affected than a lot of places with climate change. And so I think China is serious about it now, whether it can implement all the policies it needs to to contain carbon and uh, related uh, uh, greenhouse gases and so forth remains to be seen. But I think certainly climate change is an essential, almost existential uh, 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 thing that, that we can do. So let me just uh, wind up by using, uh, saying one thing, and that is in terms of what we're gonna do in terms of policy going out, don't underestimate the degree to which Taiwan remains the single most dangerous issue in US-China relations. And the Chinese are coming, I think, dangerously close to the um, belief, and it's not entirely ungrounded, but anyway, the belief that the US no longer has the one China policy, much less the one China principle that China talks about, but the one China policy I think the Chinese, as one asked me the other day, is it dead? Well, let's just put it this way. Nobody I know of has come up with a, a substitute framework to peacefully manage either that, that cross-strait relationship, much less uh, the overall relationship. So while uh, we might all concede, we can see the problems of the one China policy in our case, not to mention China's one China policy, the principle. Uh, we don't have a substitute, and I'm pretty nervous about throwing out the window things for which you have no a reasonable substitute that would be as constructive, even if problematic. So thank you very much. I hope I've said enough to uh, generate a um, lively discussion. Wow. Uh, Michael, you really gave us a, really a tour de force going from the history and summarize the gains and, uh, and also look at the future. Uh, I would like to start the discussion or question uh, by posing two questions to you. Uh, one, you began by saying about the future is there should be a strategic dialogue 
between the United States and China, but you did not elaborate. And the Chinese ambassador and the others have said very last few days, they would like to do that, but under the condition that there is um, uh, trust and mutual respect. So my question is, in what way can we restore or build trust and respect between the two countries? And my second question to you is uh, also come from your talk. And uh, you point out China has been rising militarily, economically, and uh, uh, I will put it this way. In some areas, the United States and China are like Siamese twins already, joined at the hip let's say in the economic sphere, in climate or in the pandemic. So what can United States do to really make its Siami twins to move ahead together? That's part of what you were saying in the, about the future. Um, both excellent questions, and uh, I, I'll, I'll sort of uh, bullet point my approach to uh, addressing them, uh, but there's much more to be said, and probably some of it might be contradictory to my conclusions, but let me try to uh, address it. First of all, you mentioned that, I think you said the Chinese ambassador, but if it wasn't, it, it certainly many Chinese would say it is in order to have a strategic dialogue and arms control discussions and so on, we need trust. Uh, and I mean, at one level, of, of course, that's true. But on the other hand, how do you get trust? And that is, I think you talk and you begin to negotiate about things that are important and you have transparency. So I would argue the course of dialogue and arms control discussions would enhance trust. So it's a kind of chicken and egg problem. If you make trust the precondition to start, the problem is we don't have trust. So that's the problem. Uh, how do you get it? That seems to me to be the question. Now, um, you also asked, well, what would a strategic dialogue deal with? And I'm, this isn't exhaustive, but there are certainly a couple of areas that immediately come to mind. Um, and I think we first have to recognize we're in an arms race with China. Uh, it was a recent article, I think, on the 15th of January in the New York Times, but it was on space and related developments and, and a space race like phenomenon with China. Quite extensive article. It was very interesting. But that we are in an arms race with China. And therefore, many of the mechanisms, problems, uh, and uh, avenues of, of managing these problems, we've been down that track with the, for, the former Soviet Union. Uh, within that arms race uh, bundle of issues, and of course, we have cyber, which nobody knows how to ha handle, I think, frequently. But it is, it's because it's so wound up with our domestic infrastructure. This is really almost an existential area now between infrastructure, financial interdependence, and so on. We've got to talk about shared norms in the uh, space, internet space, and so on. Also, missiles. You will note that not long ago, the US withdrew from the uh, Cold War era. Uh, INF Treaty, Intermediate uh, uh, Force Missiles Treaty with the Russians, because the Chinese are building so many missiles in Asia that we felt the constraints we agreed to with the Soviet Union now constrain us in dealing with China. So I think we've got to talk about missiles in Asia. I think we could also talk about uh, surveillance. I mean, the U.S. and and now increasingly China, uh, and uh, I'm gonna have to, um, also my uh, machine, the, the picture just went out and I'll have to put in my number. I hope you, can you hear uh, yes. Steel Bill? Yes. 
yeah. So I'll keep talking until this thing does its uh, thing. It gets me back uh -huh. picture wise. Uh, but in any case, we've got to uh, negotiate on on uh, the uh, intermediate force missiles. Let me just get my password back in here. It'll come up now. Uh, the Chinese uh, see it as an missiles now as an advantage for them and unsurprisingly are not particularly excited about this. But we've got missile competition, space competition, cyber competition, and of course, naval uh, competition. And as I was saying, I think the U.S., and I've thought it for a long time, and I've, there are many people in the U.S. government that do not agree with me, or, uh, is that uh, you know close-in surveillance do we really need to get up to 12 nautical miles on China all the, as frequently as I believe we do? Now, some people will say, yeah, we do. So and this may be a case where facts actually matter. But I think that uh, I've always felt we're a little, um, uh, we're pushing the envelope here. And if China would, uh, you know, maybe, and you don't necessarily have to have a written agreement. You can just say, watch what I'm doing and then decrease the offensive behavior on both sides. So, and you don't necessarily even have to announce it. You, know, you just work out the deal and do it and each side can verify that it's happening. So those are the kind of areas I have in mind on the strategic front. Uh, now you ask, uh, we're kind of Siamese twins, um, on the economic, oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, climate change, and um, uh, ep ep epidemiological uh, area. And I agree. Uh, and I think here, uh, th it's these areas where we have the greatest chance uh, for cooperation. But, you know, the, the US, uh, we've now re-injected ourselves back into the Paris Climate Agreement, that's good. But now we have to, you know, reconstruct the mechanisms to deal with China or re-energize them and so on. So it's going to take some time to do that. Epidemiological cooperation has quite frankly just suffered a totally unnecessary um, damage by China's initial reaction to COVID. It was not the right reaction. Uh, on the other hand, our reaction wasn't so great once it came to our shores and certainly our rhetoric uh, talking about China just uh, got nationalistic hackles and cultural pride and everything else up. I was pleased that the Biden administration recently said, let's uh, knock off the sort of ethnic characterization of this virus. I thought that was, it was a minor thing, but it was having major impacts on attitudes in China. So I think we can uh, move ahead in these areas, but we can't be in a total loggerheads in security and imposing tariffs on China and them retaliating and then expect maximal cooperation, even in areas of our uh, mutual interest. And of course, the U.S. talks about, uh, you know, climate change and, uh, and these transnational issues as important. And frankly, when the Chinese know you think something's important, they try to use it a lever to get you to stop doing things they don't like. So uh, this is not going to be easy. Uh, and then, as I say, you know, the late Trump period, uh, the uh, State Department in particular uh, issued a set of directives, not least on Taiwan, that uh, the Biden administration has not rolled back. I don't know what it'll do in the future, but I wouldn't uh, hold my breath that they're going to roll them back. Uh, and this is taken as a very serious departure from previous policy by Beijing. So uh, I agree with you, interdependence, Siamese twins, we ought to be cooperating. I think we can do some, uh, but I think, we're, you know, it could be a whole lot better. Thank you. Uh, let me go to the questions asked by others, uh, unless Bill Overhaul has a question. Uh, if not, I will move toward um, a question by Yang Guodu. 
And uh, he asked, uh, you mentioned China, uh, in China, there's a view China is on the rise, the United States is in a decline. With that kind of condition, how would that impact on the foreign relations in the dialogue or any negotiations? Well, I think most fundamentally, if you just sort of ask what's happened in the move from what we'll call constructive engagement to whatever you want to call this current era, is that we've basically moved from an era of um, reassurance, where each side was trying to reassure the other, you know, peaceful rise. Um, we want to see a strong, stable, prosperous China. To now, it's a deterrence vocabulary. And deterrence is fundamentally based on threat. Yeah. To ask or to make a threat that is credible and unacceptable to the other side. So uh, I think this, this, what I, and I've said to Chinese directly, and I, I believe it, and I'll say it now, I think China's probably overconfident. China has big problems. <laughs> Heaven knows we have big problems. But I think if China overestimates its strength and underestimates the capacity of the United States, that is going to uh, diminish deterrence. Uh, it's going to lead to the possibility of miscalculation. And I think we ought to recognize, both sides ought to recognize that these are very res resilient, capable societies when it gets down to conflict. I mean, just go back to the Korean War. I mean, China had been in what, 50 years of civil war, comes out of it and fights the US to a standstill. You know, so we're a long way from 1950. So uh, I, I guess my big fear is that overconfidence on China's part breeds uh, risk taking. And on the United States, I think we, uh, if we uh, uh, underestimate our own resilience or see ourselves in a worse position than we are, it leads us to overreaction. So I think it's very important. It's always uncertain. How do you judge the power of another nation? And how do you judge their will? Even if they have the power, do they have the political consensus? to pursue a policy. All those things are difficult to judge, but if you make a mistake, I mean, a major mistake, and I think this idea of US declining and China rising, we all can see wh where that comes from, and there's some reality. Uh, but on the other hand, it, you know, is power to be considered in absolute terms or per capita terms? If you're talking about per capita GDP, the US is gonna be ahead for, quite a long time unless we just catastrophically mismanage things. So I think it's important that we try to have a realistic appraisal of each other's capacities, uh, not to mention intentions, which are hard to judge. Thank you. That was a good, very good answer. Uh, I'd like to combine a couple of questions together. Um, uh, they are all related to what, uh, to the economics side and also strategic issues. Uh, one was uh, posed by Wei Liang and uh, he, he or she asked, uh, is Trump gonna join, I don't mean Trump, I mean Biden gonna join the CPPC, uh, how would that impact on the whole relationship? A related question is really China is developing the Belt and Road Initiative. Again, that's an economic as well as strategic effort. Uh, how would that impact on the US and China relations? Uh, both good questions, uh, and um, 
Let me just sort of signal, uh, maybe be uh, a little more succinct in my answer so we can get more questions. Uh, the issue on uh, Biden and join the successor to TPP that was pushed through after the Trump administration disassociated from the negotiations, there's now that successor uh, of trade area. The U.S. is not part of it. And I think, you know, put crisply, we forgot, we um, gave up a, a mantle of leadership on trade policy in the Pacific we should not have done. Big strategic error, in my view. Uh, and also, I just throw into the category of economic strategic missteps would also be our uh, attempt to get our allies to not get involved with the AIIB, Asia Investment Infrastructure Bank. Uh, those were both uh, mistakes. And then I think the implication of the question is, will Biden seek to get back in to that? Also, there's the issue of the bilateral investment treaty, which I think we ought to also pursue. But on the, uh, the uh, Japanese-led free trade area, I think the U.S. ought to try to get in. But I think I, I don't speak for the Biden administration, but my strong impression is that given the constellation of interest groups, and nervousness about trade. And also, you'll note one of the first things that uh, Biden did is declare Buy America for government pro, pro, uh, procurement. So uh, you can see there's, a, I'll just use a code word, sort of a protectionist element in Democratic Party politics. And uh, even uh, Secretary Clinton, when she ran for president against Trump, was nervous about indicating what, if any, trade arrangements she would pursue uh, with China. So I think this is a kind of sensitive policy within Congress and the Democratic Party, and I wouldn't expect them to be using their political capital for all these other needs on trade arrangements, uh, at least of that sort, anytime soon. Also, are the other members of the, led by Japan, of the other free trade area, uh, you know, they um, loosen some of the standards that we were talking about under TPP. And the U.S. might want to push for higher standards, and they might not be very agreeable to what the U.S. in new negotiations might want. So I would say, just taking a guess, that's going to be sometime in the future, if ever, under this administration. So uh, I, I don't expect it as an initial thing. Now, you ask about BRI, and I think that's a great question. And frankly, I think, you know, if we just try to relegate it to debt trap diplomacy, bad idea, uh, vanity projects pursued by Xi Jinping, uh, all of those elements are true. If you look at one project or another, or so it's a very mixed bag. But I, I just wrote with two colleagues, one from Singapore and one from uh, Malaysia, a book entitled Rivers of Iron about China's efforts to build high-speed rail in Southeast uh, Asia. Uh, and um, to, to make a long story short, I think many of the countries, not only in Southeast Asia, but around the world, subscribe to a theory of economic growth. And that theory is build infrastructure ahead of growth. Don't wait for the economic demand, but build the sinews of a modern civilization and you will create urbanization, population flows, capital flows that build around this new infrastructure, whether it's cyber or highways or rails. And in that sense, in that fundamental sense, China's much more on the wavelength of many of the developing and uh, middle income countries than is the US. We've been very skeptical of big infrastructure because of its human displacement, uh, inf uh, environmental impacts, uh, debt uh, burdens, all those are worthy concerns. But I think the US now is placing increasingly, as is the World Bank, more emphasis on building infrastructure. So I'm not saying the U.S. ought to, uh, you know, join in on BRI projects. I, my own view would be if it's a good one, sure. If it's a bad one, no. 
But certainly the United States has plenty of partners that it could build consortia to build infrastructure in high growth areas like Southeast Asia. And I think we ought to have that kind of policy, not to block China, but to pursue our own long-term economic interests. Okay. I know that Bill Overhaul has unmuted himself. Do you have a comment or question? I, I, I did have a question, but I see that we're actually one minute past our, our time. Is that a concern? I, if uh, Mike is willing to stay. I'm, I'm perfectly willing. Okay. Um, Mike, like you, I uh, welcome the uh, income Biden, incoming Biden administration uh, uh, for governance of the U.S. Uh, but I, I, I wonder if you're as concerned as I am about the trend of what we see early on about uh, the relationship with Asia. Uh, the new, the new uh, NSC czar uh, for Asia, Kurt Campbell, and the new Pentagon czar together wrote an article uh, in Foreign Affairs saying that engagement was a failure because it was premised on China changing politically to be a society more like ours. Uh, and, uh, as someone who's involved, uh, it was consistently involved. That's flatly untrue. Uh, and, and then they, on the economics, they list all the negatives, which are very real, and ignore all the positives. And, and the result is something that's at least as bad as the kind of Pillsbury, Navarro uh, approach under Trump. Uh, uh, Kurt kind of imported the uh, the Obama administration people and many of the policies. Uh, the big policy was the pivot. Uh, Kurt Campbell's still very proud of that. The pivot did almost nothing. It was good conceptually. Did almost nothing for our allies, uh, but it did convince China that we were out to get them and, and, and got them to mobilize. I, I'll just end with, I mean, I, could be a lot less I got your drift. With Taiwan, uh, as you say, Taiwan is, is the big risk. And uh, the Biden administration has continued the recent Trump policies by inviting the, the Taiwan representative to the inauguration. And this, this is the most explicit repudiation of the 1972 deal that we can make. Uh, sending an aircraft carrier is okay uh, legally with that deal, but we are headed toward maximum provocation. So I, I'm, I'm very concerned that, that we're headed into deep trouble. How about you? Well, uh, let me just uh, give a summary statement, which is, uh, I don't think I would change a word you said. So <laughs> that, that's the basic view, but I, I elaborate in a couple of respects. One is you mentioned our, our allies. And one thing became a way I, for this book on BRI, I, spent, I had the joy of spending a lot of time in Southeast Asia, talking to people and countries and Mahatir and so forth to get a more finely own sense of what people around China think. And each country uh, around China's periphery is its own story. So it's not uniformity, but I would think that it would be fair to say that no country around China's periphery really wants to have to choose between economic opportunity with China uh, and the security provided by the US. And they are, generally speaking, in some countries, less or more so than others. Vietnam is, seems to be a little less concerned about offending China in some respects. Um, other countries uh, like Thailand and Malaysia 
seem more comfortable. But basically, they all want to hedge. They don't want a in-your-face security posture by the U.S. because that produces bad behavior, in their view, from Beijing. Uh, and on the other hand, they don't want to be bullied by China, so they want to have a plausible security relationship with the U.S., but they don't want it to be so explicit and in, in your face. Uh, I think we ought to be able to live with that posture. I think we can prosper with that posture. So uh, it, it seems to me that this explicit emphasis on allies, uh, the military component of the competition, and so forth, they're all real as I described, but uh, it's, it's like the, the, the words to the music are, 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 you know, not consistent with the melody. Kind of. it, it's, so I think uh, also it, it just seems to me that um, uh, getting to the administration, uh, the Biden administration, as I said, is, I think, on a process analysis, far superior. I mean, more knowledgeable people more people willing to answer the phone when Beijing calls, more people willing to talk to the Chinese ambassador, yep. more willing, the, the, the lines are open. So now we're get, at least we can talk about what ought to be said across them. But to your major question, which is we are downplaying the pluses and uh, overestimating the uh, minuses of, of um, engagement is precisely why I spent 10 minutes talking about what's the balance sheet in U.S.-China relations. And the answer is the balance sheet of the last 40 years would suggest it's not a, been a huge fiasco. Now, unfortunately, I would say we both got leaders that we would not have predicted or hoped for in both China and the United States. And that's changed a lot of reality. And China's gotten stronger and its people more confident and people playing to that as they do in the US. And so we've got a lot of things that you didn't have to contend with in uh, the engagement era. But it's one thing, I, I, the posture I would adopt is recognize engagement for what it was, what it achieved, and at the same time, acknowledge how things have changed and direct your, uh, your efforts at those things that are most feasible, that address what has changed in the most negative way and move forward. Uh, you know, the, uh, I, I, yeah, in a way, if you look at the personnel, I think it, it's kind of interesting. You might look at Biden and he has one set of experiences from Senate Foreign Relations Committee, having been the interlocutor with Xi Jinping. I don't pretend to know all of his thinking. But uh, let's put it this way, the people at the second, third, and fourth levels of the bureaucracy dealing with China now are in many respects people that were involved earlier when we made the, uh, you know, the rebalance, the pivot, whatever you want to call it. And so I think they're, they're picking up the reins, so to speak, conceptually, pretty much where they left them off. Thank you. Um... We ran over time already, so I'm sorry I have to bring this, this to a close. Uh, one of our experts at Harvard on climate change, Chris ne Nielsen, uh, has a question, but it's very complicated. It would take a long time to answer. Oh. I will urge him to write to you, and you can respond to him separately. All right? I'd be glad if I have anything uh, useful to say, I'd be glad to. And thank you, Mike. You live up to your reputation as a preeminent scholar expert on China. And we really benefit from you. And personally, you highlighted for me, really there's a major change between US motive to engage China from 1960s, 70s, and now that actually is to become a reverse almost. And so we have to establish a new relationship. And you offer some very concrete 
ideas and uh, on behalf of the United States as well as look at the China's interest. Thank you for such an educational. Well, wow. thank you and your colleagues. And um, I just have my highest respect for Ezra and uh, please convey my best wishes to Charlotte. Thank you. Okay, we're gonna sign off now. Bye. Bye-bye.